So hello, everyone. Um, good morning to those watching from Brazil, or good afternoon to those of you who are in Europe, which is where I am talking from, and Sophie too. My name is Cesar Lima. I'm assistant professor of psychology at the University Institute of Lisbon, and this. So is hello, everyone. Um, good morning to those watching from Brazil, or good afternoon to those of you who are in Europe, which is where I am talking from, and Sophie too. My name is Cesar Lima. I'm assistant professor. I'm sorry, there was a technical glitch here. So um, as I was saying, my name is Cesar Lima. I'm assistant professor of psychology at ISCTE, University Institute of Lisbon, and this is Abralim Ao Vivo, an initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association designed to give students and researchers free access to state-of-the-art discussions on the most diverse topics related to the study of human language. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker today, Professor Sophie Scott, who's going to give a talk titled From Laughter to Language and Back Again, The Neural Basis of Vocal Communication. Sophie is the director of the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience at University College London, where she also runs the Speech Communication Lab. Her research mm -hmm. focuses on the neural basis of speech perception and production. She was a pioneer of functional neuroimaging work on this topic, and she is also interested in vocal emotional expressions, especially laughter. She has published over 150 papers. Some of them are among the most influential ones in the field. And she has also been doing a lot of public engagement work, including being a TED speaker. Her 2015 um, TED talk, Why We Laugh, has over 4 million views. I counted yesterday. Sophie is a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences of the British Academy, and she was also recently appointed commander of the Order of the British Empire. Thank you so much, Sophie, for your contribution to this series. And just a quick note before you start, everyone watching can ask questions in the chat window, and we can discuss them with Sophie uh, at the end. Please feel free to ask questions in English or in Portuguese if you prefer. I'm happy to translate them uh, afterwards. So please join me welcoming, welcoming Sophie. Thank you very much, Cesar, and thank you very much, Abilene Avivo, for inviting me. This is a real delight, and it's a lovely way to spend a Saturday. I'm just going to share my screen and make sure that I'm sharing my sound and make sure that I have the right. Now, when I share my screen, you're going to notice that I have subtly changed my title because I could not make the talk work by going from laughter to language and back again. We're going to go from language to laughter, so we're going to cover the same ground, but hopefully in a way that makes more coherent sense. And I want to start, when I talk about language, what I'm talking about is, is humans uh, speaking and using their voices for communication. So it is already a, it's a narrower view of language than the, the wider world of linguistics. And in fact, what I want to do is take a bit of a step back and think about the evolutionary processes that have led to the things that we can do with our voices, because this is going to be relevant for speech, but it's also going to be relevant for thinking about laughter. So the... The basic way that mammals vocalise is highly conserved in evolution. And what this means is vocalisation, the production of vocalisations is something that is pretty similar, actually, across land mammals, certainly. And what land mammals do when they vocalise is they use the larynx. And that's a structure that has evolved in evolution to stop things from falling into the lungs. So it's a very important structure in, in land dwelling vertebrates. But and it closes shut and it stops things from falling into the lungs. And that's how it has evolved. But most mammals have actually, land mammals have evolved a way that involves closing the larynx and then blowing air up through the larynx from the lungs to make a sound. Now this is called the source filter theory of vocalizations. And what it says is the source of the sound that mammals make is this closing of the two folds of the larynx, and I'll show you an example of that in a second, and then pushing air through that, it vibrates the two, vo the two sides of the larynx is back and forth, and then makes a buzzing sound. So it's an air-based way of, of vocalizing. Air is controlled and pushed out, and then the filter is how you then shape that sound, and that, that gives you um, different characteristics. So for example, the loud, the more you open your mouth, the, that will change the spectral characteristics, the filter characteristics of the sound. And I'll show you some examples of this. But first we look at this in action. So this is just the source filter theory applied to a deer and the deer is vocalizing because he's in rut. 
So the deer larynx is pretty low down. So you've got a long old tube to make the sounds that the deer is about to make. Deer larynxes, like human larynxes, are also movable. So you'll actually see the larynx move up and down. And that changes some of the characteristics. So the, the source is moving up and down and that changes its pitch. So you might just be able to see the larynx moving up and down there. And you'll also notice that the deer was throwing his head back, that's making the vocal tract even longer, and opening his mouth. And that's giving that's that's the filter affecting the source sound. Now that's actually quite different in humans, and I'll show you why. So a few things are well, a number of things are quite different about humans in terms of evolution that directly affect what we can do with our voices. So, first of all, you'll notice that that deer, like most mammals has got a really long face that's because of smell really matters to mammals and they tend to have large noses large nasal mucosa and that's giving them a long long face and a long oral tract now primates have shorter flatter faces and humans have yet flatter faces again so we've actually got strikingly fat faces and this has direct consequences on what we can do with our voices so what this means is our tongues do not have to be long and thick and tongues have evolved to help masticate food and things like that and what we're able to do instead of having a long tongue that reaches the, to the front of a long mouth we have short mouths and short tongues so our tongues are short and nimble and I'll show you one in action in a minute a couple of other differences. All other mammals have got flat roofs of the mouth. If you feel the roof of your mouth, you'll notice that it's domed. And you, this arched shape of the roof of the mouth in humans means not only are our mouths short, but they're also tall. And what that gives us is a space in which our tongues can move that is quite precise. Another way that our tongues are different and able to move in these ways is that the larynx in the human is permanently descended. It doesn't move up and down like the deer larynx, it is always lowered and it can also move like the deer larynx. And that does a couple of things. And the first thing that it does is it frees up the back of the tongue. So what you actually have for the human tongue is something that's more like an octopus tentacle than the large piece of mobile muscle that you find in all other mammals. And that's really important with our voices because what we do is we make a sound at our larynx, just like any other mammal, but then we can shape that sound with real flexibility to the filter that we apply to that sound is very different in humans because of what our tongues can do in combination with our jaws, and our lips and our soft palate. The other thing that is affected by our lowered larynx is actually what we can do with our breath. And that's a side of speech. Sorry, I'll just show you. This, this is the voice in action. So there's that tongue. She just, this woman is just speaking English in the scanner and we're running the scanner as a way of imaging the vocal tract dynamically. You can see these movements, these incredibly precise movements of the tongue. She's shaping the sound she makes at the larynx and you've got this continual reshaping of this filter. So that's giving us the sounds of language can be considered to be resulting from these changes in the filter characteristics of the voice. Now this sounds ridiculous, but actually this is stunningly complex and there aren't any other land mammals that can do this kind of thing with their voices. I keep saying land mammals because things seem to be slightly different for sea mammals and I'm happy to take questions on that. So this is what evolution has given us, these short flat mouths with a tall roof that give us a short nimble tongue that has evolved to be this incredibly precise coordinator and shaper of the filter. And if you compare the spectrogram, though this is just showing us the time axis along here, we've got frequency up here and where there is a brighter, hotter colour, there is more energy. At the top here we have a mammal vocalisation, so this is a dog barking. So there's quite a lot of complexity there. You can hear there were changes in the pitch. And this is showing you very strongly some patterns, both of the harmonics in the sound of the dogs and also some spectral characteristics, but that's so some spectral prominences. And that's coming from the resonance characteristics of the dog's mouth when it opens its mouth. Now, if we look at the same information for a human, and this is just a human saying a very boring sentence, they're buying some bread. 
They're buying some bread. You start to glimpse the complexity of what the filter can do for the human voice. So if you look here at buying, if you say the word aloud to yourself, buying, you can actually feel that your tongue moves a lot around inside your oral cavity. And that's changing these resonance characteristics, these filter characteristics. And you're seeing these changes in these changes of the spectral prominences in the voice. So we go buying into the nasal mm sound, you get a very different shaping and you're not seeing that in the dog vocalizations. You're also seeing other sorts of sounds. So here we've got this in some, or in fact, you don't make a sound at the larynx at all. And what you're doing is producing a noisy sound, a s sound just at the behind the teeth at the alveolar ridge. And you've also got things like this, the d at the end of bread actually involves a complete cessation of making sound, red, d, and then this plosive sound when you release all that energy. So the complexity here is intense and that's giving us a completely different possibility for the sounds the human voice can make. <laughs> So it's not going to play all the sounds again. They're buying some. Now, another thing that has made a really big difference to humans, and it actually is related to our lowered larynx, is that we walk upright. So these changes have happened up here, but they're not the only things that contribute to our voices. So humans walk upright. We are the upright apes. And this has fundamentally changed the way that we can use our voices. And the way that it does this is it has given us a completely different control over the muscles between our rib cages. And those are the intercostal muscles, inner and outer intercostal muscles. And we've also got the diaphragm here. Now, all land-based ma mammals and vertebrates use their lungs to and the muscles around the lungs to get air in and out of the lungs so if i was to put a breath belt on you so just to measure your respiratory rate so this would just be something that measures how your chest wall moves as you breathe in and out what i would be able to see as you breathe in you use the intercostal muscles to basically pull the rib cage out and up. This creates negative pressure inside the lungs, air is pulled in, you then relax those muscles back down and the air is pushed out. If I was to look at the movement of your rib cage, that would give me something roughly sinusoidal, just reflecting this, what's called metabolic breathing. And you share this with, with dogs and cats and horses. But because we walk upright, we don't need to use these same muscles to support our weight. If you are a quadruped, all other mammals walk on all four limbs, you do need to do that. And that severely compromises how they can use those muscles for other things. Because we walk upright, we have freed up our intercostal muscles. And what you can find is that humans actually have a, a very different pattern of neural control over these muscles. And we have as much fine control over these muscles as we do over our fingers, it's incredibly precise. And we use that when we're speaking. So as soon as we start talking, we take a breath in, and then we use those same intercostal muscles to do something very different. Instead of just pushing air in and out of the lungs, we use the intercostal muscles to very finely control how the flow of air is passing through the larynx. And that gives us the ability to produce a very finely controlled sound at the larynx. If I keep talking without another breath, you can hear how much work I have to do. Now, that's what I mean by fine control, because we can't see it, we can't see the precision of these movements, but actually maintaining this constant subglottal pressure and controlling that is incredibly important to be able to use our voice at all. If we couldn't do this, no matter what we could do with our filter, we would only be able to speak on an exhalation. So we might talk in this very slow way. So this is actually giving us a tremendous amount of the, the content of the structure of spoken language is actually coming down from the rib cage and the control of breath. So the first thing that is happening is that we are able to speak over a longer period of time. We are able to speak in sentences because we can breathe in this way, because we can control our breath in this way. And in fact, this seems to be very important to the production of speech. People you can accurately determine for how long somebody is going to talk by looking at the size of the breath that they take before they start speaking, because people very rarely interrupt a sentence to start breathing. So it's part of the planning of an articulation is, in fact, this planning of how you're going to control the breath. And the other things that are coming in here are happening at the level of the larynx. So that's giving you the melody and the rhythm of the speech is actually very strongly influenced by what's happening with your breath control. 
and that's if we look at this in detail so these are the this is the larynx this is the larynx open which is happening when you're all just staying alive and breathing and then as soon as you start to vocalize you bring those together so this is what i mean by highly conserved this would look exactly the same in a in a gerbil or a or a deer the scale would be different but the structures would look very similar and if you record the sound at the larynx you're hearing just this buzzing sound but listen what's still there now you could probably hear something that sounded like it had a melody to it because we always speak with with intonation and there was a distinct rhythm to it because that's what's coming in at the level of the larynx and if you are a, a native british speaker you might have recognized that that's a nursery rhyme jack and jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water and that is because you recognize the melody now, of course, it doesn't sound like someone talking because we've got all this lovely kind of filtering coming in and putting all this other information on. This, the actual speech sounds aren't there yet. But that's the amount of information that's coming in purely from being able to control your breath in this way. Just a quick glimpse at the larynx in action. Hello. I haven't had visitors in so long. What are you? I'm a voice box. Some people call me a larynx. See my two vocal cords moving apart and together as I talk? They come apart so that the air can get through them, and they come together to vibrate and make sound as I exhale. Let me show you. So the lowered larynx that I pointed out earlier, it doesn't just free up the back of the tongue, which it does do, to enable you to use the tongue in this much more complex way to shape the sounds that you're making at this filter level but it also gives you a, a longer pipe to make the sounds of speech. And there's even a physics argument that said it's easier to control the sound being made at the larynx if it is closer to the source of the air being pushed up from the lungs. So the, the lowered larynx is really important to us in our evolution of our voices and our speech. Now, if we take this into brains, the thing that I want you to take away from what I've said so far, and I will return to some of these elements, is the complexity of the sounds that we make when we speak. Now, if we think about this in terms of brain systems, we have known for a long time, the researchers in Germany and France in the 1800s made incredible developments mapping out parts of the brain that we knew to be important in the processing of speech and language. So for example, Paul Broca had a patient, Tong, who had great difficulty speaking. He could only say his name, Tong, that's why he was called Tong. He could swear and that was it. He had no other ability to vocalize. And Paul Broca had hypothesized along with other French neurologists that the posterior third of the left inferior, inferior sorry, the posterior third of the left inferior frontal gyrus was important in the control of speech. So he predicted that Tong would have a lesion here and Tong did have a lesion there. Um, and that since everything that we have learned about what gets called Broca's area rather than Tan's area over the next 150, 170 years has shown that there are other functions for this brain region, but it is very, very important in the controlled production of speech. A few years after Broca's work, Carl Wernicke in Germany described the superior temporal gyrus on the left as being particularly important for the perception of speech. And he had patients who had lesions in these fields who had difficulty understanding what was being said to them. Now, of course, all of these studies are being done with people who are being investigated post-mortem because that was the only way of asking questions about the brains and what was happening in brains at the time. Um, if we look over the next 170, 180 years, as functional imaging comes in and we're able to go in and ask questions about brain structures, Broca's area hasn't shifted too much. As I say, we've kind of added to some of its functions, but it's stayed in the same area. Whereas Broca's, Wernicke's area has really kind of splurged out into the middle temporal gyrus, the inferior parietal lobe. And one of the things I want to argue today is actually there's a lot of things going on in here. These are all relevant to the processing of vocalizations, but it's not one cardinal function that is occurring within this. Now, when I was first working in functional imaging back in the 1990s, we were working with this model because we had people who started doing functional imaging studies from the 1980s onwards with these techniques like positron emission tomography at first and then functional magnetic resonance imaging came in. And people started asking questions about speech and language 
and the neuroanatomy of speech and language in these intact brains that we could study with functional imaging, um, largely because we had such a clear roadmap of what we would expect to see from the papers that were out there and based on the patients that have been studied. So we're now not looking at patients, we're looking at intact brains, but we were fairly certain of what we should find. And particularly in terms of Wernicke's area, by the time I was working functional imaging in the 1990s, there was a very clear view that the core of Wernicke's area would be sitting at the back end of the left temporal lobe. That seemed to be a really important overlapping field for different patients who had Wernicke's aphasia, a problem with understanding speech. The lesions seem to be clustered back here. This largely came from a very influential paper from the 1970s, which I thoroughly recommend you read, which has got the very helpful title, Wernicke's Region, Where Is It? by Bogan and Bogan. Um, Bogan and Bogan were two neurologists and certainly John Bogan, um, he is a very charismatic neurologist who actually turns up in a Philip K. Dick novel, but that's not true for most neuroscientists. And this paper is quite clear. What you've, if you're looking for Wernicke's area, where is it? Well, it's at the back end of the left temporal lobe. That's where you should be finding things. So this is around the time when I start getting involved in these studies. We put people into the scanner, we get them listening to speech, and what we find is this. Absolutely no suggestion of a left lateralized function at all. So this is a study where people are listening to speech versus hearing nothing. And this is what used to be called a glass brain projection. So this is showing you all the activity that we've recorded here looking from the left of the brain, here looking from the back of the brain, that's the left, that's the right. Here looking from the top of the brain, there's the left, there's the right. Not a hint, you could not put a fig leaf between the two hemispheres on this. And one thing that we had from the patient literature was that speech perception and production was something that was firmly left lateralized. We're not seeing anything like that here. And then of course we realized, well, actually, just because you played somebody noise, uh, sorry, speech, and what you care about is the brain responses to speech because you're studying speech and language. Um, what you're always seeing in functional imaging studies is relative patterns of activation. There's no ground zero for these studies. What you're always looking at is relative changes across conditions. And here, our baseline comparison was silence. And of course, the brain doesn't care about your experiment. The brain doesn't care that you're, you think you're studying speech and language here. So what was happening here was people were hearing words versus hearing nothing at all. And of course, as soon as there's words, there's a talker. As soon as there's a talker, there's all that other information that you have in a talker's voice, so they male or female, with regional accent, all the other information that you can glean accurately or inaccurately from their voice is there. And there's also an immensely complex sound. There is, as I've said, probably nothing else quite as complex as the human voice that you encounter. And so there's, there's, there's no control for this whatsoever. We, can, we can't look at this activation and say anything about whether it's to do with the speech component or the voice component or the noise component. So we needed to go back to the first sort of principles here. And this is where I got really involved in doing function, you know, kind of getting really started to think about this. So those are those spectrograms I showed you before. And this is that sentence I played you before. They're buying some bread. They're buying some bread. So you're seeing here this beautiful pattern of spectral complexity and all these different little elements that are keeping in with different sorts of speech sounds. What we needed was a better baseline for than silence. And people tried other things. People tried backwards speech or foreign languages. And none of it's quite satisfactory because none of it really controls for the, the real complexity of speech. And my colleague, Stuart Rosen, suggested that we should use a technique called spectral rotation. Now, spectral rotation literally involves flipping speech sound upside down or any sound upside down in the spectral domain. So you have all the same information. If you look here, it looks like a mirror image of the spectrogram above but the information is now falling in the wrong place in the, in the frequency domain, and you can't understand it. And it sounds like this. Now you can learn to understand this. I can understand this sort of speech transformation, but I've worked with it for 25 years. Um, and I can only understand this particular speaker when he has been spectrally rotated. So it doesn't seem to generalize well. And none of our participants had had that kind of experience. So when people are exposed to this, they can't hear what any intelligibility in this speech but it sounds it's got the right information in fact barry blesser who invented spectrally rotated speech said it sounds like an alien speaking your language but with completely different articulators so i'm just going to play the two again they're buying some bread the other thing i just want to flag here is the rotated speech maintains some of the sense of pitch 
that was there in the original speech. Just one last time. Listen to the prosody now. They're buying some bread. They're buying some bread. And it's reduced here, but you can still hear it. And that's because you don't completely foul up the harmonic structure when you do this. And we also wanted another kind of intelligible speech. And for this, we went to a technique called noise vocoded speech, which was invented by... Um, Oh, I'm not going blank on this completely in the 1990s and it's it basically takes the speech and it's what it is is a simulation of what somebody with a it's invented by Bob Shannon thank, thank you Bob Shannon it, sem, it simulates a cochlear implant so if you were to restore hearing to somebody who'd lost all their hearing by stimulating the cochlear at different points with the sound from the environment you get this very reduced spectral sort of information because you're only sampling across particular bandwidths of the spectral information out there and it doesn't say it, it, they're always kind of it's, it sounds like a harsh whisper because these cochlear implants are sort of oriented to try and improve maximize the, the speechiness of what you can hear because that's often what people want to restore when they've lost their hearing So you can hear it sort of sounds like a harsh whisper. Just try again. If you're not a native speaker of English, you may may not be may not jump out at you at first. So that's that same sentence. And you can see here how very reduced that spectral information is. And that's an amazing insight into the, the plasticity of your ability to deal with this kind of um, with speech information. People adapt to this very, very quickly if it's in their native language. And then, of course, we have another comparison. We've got rotated noise vocoded speech. So now we flip that same signal upside down. And as far as we can know, no one can learn to understand this. There's too much information has gone. The information is appearing at the wrong place in your cochlea and it's been extremely degraded in the spectral domain. So what we're interested in here is comparing these two conditions which are intelligible this one with a little bit of pre-training with these two baseline conditions. So it's what used to be called a conjunction design. So if you look on the brain that I'm about to show you, look for the yellow regions. They are showing you the regions that are equally activated by these two intelligible speech conditions, although they sound very different. You couldn't even tell if that, that noise vocoded speech, you couldn't even tell if it was a male or female voice. But that, this brain region doesn't care. It's responding to both equally relative to these two baselines. And in fact, as you move forward down the temporal lobe, so that primary auditory cortex where sound is kind of first hitting the cortex is sitting up here. And as you move away from that forward down the temporal lobe, what you're seeing is in fact the response to the rotated speech drops away. And remember the rotated speech is that signal that everything's still being preserved in there, it's just in the wrong place. And it sounds like something talking, but you can't understand it. The brain is trying to process it and it's taking it as far as it can do, and then you end up just with this selective response to something that's intelligible. Now, the very striking thing here was that we were at the wrong end of the temporal lobe. We were expecting something sitting back here and we really are not seeing it. And it didn't make sense. Why weren't we seeing where Bogan and Bogan had said the core area for Wernicke's area should be? Well, it turns out it's because we were looking probably at the wrong literature. I'm very happy to take questions about why Bogan and Bogan put Wernicke's area at the back end of the temporal lobe, not at the front. The short answer, according to my, uh, my late colleague, Richard Wise, is that actually, because this is mostly coming from the stroke literature, strokes start at the back of the temporal lobe and then run forward. So you are, your form does not follow function when we're looking at strokes. Strokes don't take out selective functional areas. They're following the vascular anatomy. And that's where you get this back to front or, or, or evolution of strokes. And then what we had to do instead was to look at a different literature. And the literature that we started to look at were papers that were coming out in the 1990s, arguing that as in the visual system, where you have multiple pathways for processing visual sources of information, that there was very good evidence in the non-human primate brain that the same was true for sound. And people like Carson Hackett or Joseph Rauschecker were publishing these papers arguing that as you, you've got this, again, you've got primary auditory cortex sitting up here, and as we move away from it, running forward down the temporal lobe, you find cells that are selectively responsive to calls made by other monkeys, different sorts of calls. Whereas these posterior auditory areas, they cared a lot more about where the sounds came from and, and some somatosensory information associated with those sounds. So if your face, face is touched, you get 
auditory responses there. Um, and this does seem to sit on top of an anatomical pathway. So again, within these non-human primate studies, what you can find is the organization as in visual cortex of core belt and parabelt. So this core belt and parabelt are very, they're very distinctive attributes of how primate brains process sensory information. And it seems to be associated with hierarchical processing. So you get sound first coming in largely being from the auditory thalamus is projecting, sorry, I'm going to cough. <coughs> it's projecting to these core fields, primary auditory cortex, and then those project out to belt and to parabelt fields. And the connectivity follows this. So the anterior, the ros rostral core fields are projecting mostly to rostral belt and parabelt fields. And likewise, for the posterior thing. So you're, you're maintaining this kind of anterior posterior distinction. These, the auditory cortex is long and thin, and that's actually, that's got a directionality associated with it. And largely it is neurons here that are projecting forward down the temporal lobe and up into prefrontal cortex. Whereas from the back, they are projecting up through inferior parietal cortex and to non overlapping, but adjacent fields in prefrontal cortex. There are some uh, functionality associated with this. So we, we tend to find tonotopy, which is preserved all the way up through the auditory, ascending auditory pathway up to primary auditory cortex. And then as you move, this is Joseph Rauschecker's work, as you move away from core auditory fields, you find cells that are more and more interested in wider bandwidth sounds, so potentially more complex sounds. And then, as I said, the sensitivity to conspecific vocalizations, spatial representations of sound, and, and somatosensory information in these posterior auditory fields. So the, the, the thing takeaway here for us for this particular study was that these conspecific vocalizations were sitting in these anterior temporal lobe fields, just like our initial responses to intelligible speech, which was very interesting because although human use of vocalizations and communication vocally is obviously much more complex than that of other primates, other primates do still communicate using vocalizations and what we might be seeing given that our brains are still primate brains is like the way into the system is following the same functional anatomy of the non-human primates and the other thing that i think is important to take away from this is that when we talk about auditory perception as indeed when we talk about visual perception we're not talking about one thing there are multiple different ways that information is being processed in in auditory cortex there are at least two anatomically distinct processing streams potentially more and when we're thinking about perception what that might mean for example for communication we need to think exactly about what kind of recruitment of these auditory areas we might expect to see so one, the other thing that I want to point out is I've emphasized left hemisphere here. So the left hemisphere is where we found this intelligibility response. And it's where we have this, um, you know, this long history from the from this patient study saying that it's the left side of the brain that's really important for processing speech and language. But there was still stuff happening on the right. And remember when I showed you the people listening to speech versus hearing nothing study right earlier, it was completely bilateral. And what we're seeing here, oh, sorry, I'll come back to that. Um, so I'll come back to the bilaterality. So the, the thing here is, OK, so this is one study from um, 1990, sorry, from 2000. And, it, you know, that's quite old, um, but it's not sort of sat there unexplored in any more detail. So we've replicated it several times in a few different studies. We've also gone in in a bit more detail because the criticism is and you could say, well, Sophie, this is all sentences. It's all they're buying some bread and different, you know, you're going in there with these different sentences. So um, now it's true that words do go that far forward as well. But there's a lot more information in speech, even at this more granular level than words. So we did a study where we compared activation to people listening to isolated phonemes and we used unvoiced phonemes like. And we were comparing those with. Uh, signal correlated noise, which is basically a single noise channel, a bit like noise vocoded speech. It's something with the envelope of speech, but none of the spectral detail. Um, and we also used sounds that are not speech sounds in English, but which are speech sounds in some 
languages of sub-Saharan Africa. And those are ingressive click sounds. So I just have a very quick example here. This is Miriam McCabe singing the click song. And you'll hear her making these sounds over, as part of her singing in, hang on, in her language. And the thing to look out for here is that if you don't speak these languages, to me, I can't even hear the click sounds as being part of her voice because they're made by sucking air into the mouth. And for English speakers, they, they are so unlike the way that we make speech sounds, they don't even sound like speech sounds. So just have a quick listen. <laughs> So in this study, we're going to pair, compare speech sounds, individual speech sounds that are part of the phonemic repertoire of our participants. We've got very similar speech sounds. So we've got these sounds for English speakers and the ingressive speech sounds that we chose were all ones that are used or encountered in British culture, but which are not speech sounds. So things like And those are all aggressive speech sounds. Some of those you could hear in Miriam McCabe's singing, but they are made by pulling air into the mouth, which is not something that happens in English languages at all. And they are not heard as speech sounds. So they're familiar. People make these kind of sounds or to like a giddy up sound or is a kissing sound or is an irritated sound. Is a, it sounds like horse clip clopping. They're sounds that people can make, but they are absolutely not linguistic sounds. And it was comfortably the most boring study I've ever been a participant in because people were just listening to the sounds. If we look at the comparison of speech sounds with the, against the click sounds or the bass line, what you can see is there is some bilateral activation, but it's more extensive on the left. So even if you are hearing these little isolated shreds of speech, you are driving this anterior going pathway with an emphasis on the left. What was interesting is we did see a selective response to the click sounds and the speech sounds over the baseline on the right side of the brain. And I'm going to be coming back to the right side of the brain in a bit, but it certainly looked like um, you could find brain areas that cared about voice sounds from humans, whether or not they were linguistic, but they were now sitting on the right side of the brain. This is a study where we looked at syntactic structure and these are just brain areas that are distinguishing between different kinds of syntactic structure in English, where the semantic content of the sentences has been held roughly constant. And what we're seeing is this is happening again in this anteriorly directed stream in the superior temporal gyrus. So very, these brain areas that are sensitive to phonemes are also sensitive to semantics, well, to syntactic structure, which work by Angela Friderici has also strongly suggested. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, of course, it wasn't the whole story to look on the left. So if we look on the right side of the brain from that earlier study, what we found was we've got a lot of activation on the right, but that wasn't associated with intelligibility. The right side of the brain, like the two speech-like conditions, the intelligible speech and the spectrally rotated speech, contrasted with those two noise-excited conditions. Now, of course, this is hard to say, is it because it sounds a bit voice-like or is it because both conditions contain pitch information? And we do know that pitch information is preferentially processed in the right temporal lobe. Now, pitch is a bit like color in sound. It's processed along complex ways. It's not one sim single acoustic characteristic that derives a sense of pitch. Your brain needs to compute pitch across temporal, spectral, and periodic cues. And it will do that, um, harmonic cues, I should say. It does that bilaterally, but the right temporal lobe cares about the directionality of pitch. So patients who have these regions resected, and Ingrid John Drew showed this very nicely in epilepsy patients, they can tell if two sounds boop, boop, have got the different pitch. What they can't hear is whether the pitch goes up or down. So the right temporal lobe seems to be particularly important for structuring that information. And of course, that's always there in speech. We don't talk to each other like this. We would think it very strange. And it's, in fact, all languages, all spoken languages use pitch variation in a very complex way to add into the, the meaning and the sort of pragmatic sense of what's being said and the emotional sense of what's being said, in addition to languages that also use pitch linguistically. So it is a very important characteristic of spoken communication, and it possibly has some partic particularly strong right hemisphere involvement. 
Um, I mentioned earlier that the click sounds and the speech sounds together seem to be associated with right hemisphere activation. And we also found that when we looked at non-speech sounds, so sounds like screams or laughs, and I'm going to come back to laughs, or disgusted sounds, they showed a very similar pattern of activation with a strong emphasis at the front end of the temporal lobe associated with the, the clear, intelligible versions of these speech sounds versus the regions in red, which are also sensitive to effectively rotated versions. The difference here being that the activation was again in the right side of the brain. And this study with um, Kyung and Stuart Rosen, where we just compared directly speech that had normal intonational patterns. So uh, they're buying some bread, the man tied his scarf, where you have very clear patterns of intonation. And Stuart Rosen resynthesized some of these speech, half of these speech items to have a falling pitch structure. If you have a completely flat pitch structure, it sounds very, very odd and you get a lot of weird, weird ringing artifacts. So Stuart flattened them out, but slightly falling down. And because of the physics of how we speak, sentences do generally tend to decline in pitch towards the end. And so these sounded a bit like this. I'm afraid I don't have an example, but instead of they're buying some bread, they would sound like they're buying some bread. And it's completely flat and linear and it sounds odd. And I thought these sounded so odd that we were gonna get lots of weird activation associated with that, but no, we didn't. What we found was that the left side of the brain didn't really care about what was happening with the intonation of what was being said, consistent with the left side of the brain starting to show some more abstract response to the linguistic information in speech. Whereas the right side of the brain was absolutely sensitive to the presence of natural intonation relative to these flattened speech stimuli, which is very striking. So this really is quite interesting. You're seeing a selective response in the right temporal lobe to naturalistic intonation. And of course, just a final point on this, it's not the only thing that is important for understanding speech or communication is bound up in the acoustics. So um, this was a study where we were just looking at the, what the effect was of a talker looking at you when you speak. And we did this in collaboration with my colleague Andy Calder in Cambridge, who was very interested in eye gaze. And he'd found there were right temporal lobe fields that were particularly sensitive to whether or not a, a, someone is looking at you, directly at you, which is of course used in a very complex way by humans. Um, and parallel fields to so these kind of intelligibility fields that we had found for speech. So what we found was we, we used um, noise vocoded speech and a talker at the same time. So you're seeing somebody speaking and their voice would be noise vocoded. And we did this deliberately because it meant you had to look at the talker to understand what she was saying. Because if you can see a speaker, these kinds of degraded speech is really, really improved. So across all of these conditions, the speech doesn't change. It's all been noise vocoded to a very low number of channels. People have to look at the speaker and the speaker is either looking down, looking at them, looking away or with her eyes obscured. And if we look at the condition where she is looking at you, it does not improve intelligibility. Having the mouth moving and the head moving is what helps you understand better when you can see a speaker as well as hear them. But in the condition where she's looking at you, you see an enhanced response to this intelligibility effect on the left hand side, presumably because although it may be a more abstract representation of the speech, it is a more salient interpretation of the meaning of the speech because it looks like it's being directed at you. And of course, as I said, humans are much more complex in their use of language than other non-human primates. So this is definitely not those might be sharing a similar kind of input to the system. It's not in any sense the end of the language system at the brain level, not even beginning to glimpse it. Um, so, for example, if you do things in a more complex way by adding in, for example, just more power to your contrast. Here we have both English speakers and native Mandarin speakers listening to intelligible speech over these rotated baselines. You're getting this left anterior lobe activation common to both languages but you're also starting to see really anterior temporal lobe fields and basal length areas at the bottom running on the bottom of the temporal lobe which is strongly associated with amodal semantic representations and in this study what we did was we used noise vocoded speech so that to get the behavior of comprehension of speech off ceiling and this is with Jonas Oblesser what we did was we we used sentences of low and high predictability so what you find is that if you have 
very very little auditory information it doesn't matter how intelligent how unpredictable a sentence is so a predictable sentence would be something like the ship sailed across the bay and an unpredictable sentence would be something like sue discussed the dive so the ship sailed across the bay you have a lot of semantic and syntactic predictions helping you anticipate or you know kind of priming responses from these other semantic representations for sue discussed the dive unless you know something about Sue and her diving interests, it's very hard for you. There's no way that you could predict that after Sue is going to come, the word disgust is going to come the word dive. So what you find is that you can really hugely improve the intelligibility of speech just by how predictable it is. And we're taking advantage of that here. So in this study, we have people listening to high and low predictable sentences across different amounts of auditory information, which we're varying by noise locoding the speech. And what we find is the condition where there is maximal benefit of the sentences being predictable, when we look at the brain regions associated with that compared to the low predictable sentences, what you're finding is an enormous activation, kind of again, jumping right out of the temporal lobe. So now we're seeing this very distributed left lateralized activation in inferior frontal regions, parietal regions, medial prefrontal regions. And we also have activation in the precuneus, all associated with a much wider distributed language processing system. So as soon as context can help you understand, you're seeing a much wider network recruited, which makes sense. It's not never going to be just one little bit of the brain helping you understand what's being said. And strikingly, this is a study where we had people making semantic decisions on words. So they're just reading words and working out what they mean in a particular context. And you're seeing a very similar network activated. So again, these medial prefrontal regions, inferior frontal regions, the very distributed network associated with, in this instance, semantic processing of language. Because that's not the only thing that's going on when we're talking and when we are listening to other people talking. And I just want to think a little bit about some of these other areas in auditory cortex that we know are showing auditory responses. All these posterior regions that I mentioned that aren't really showing anything to do with intelligibility in speech. Well, they seem to be very important in sensory motor links in speech production. So this is a really old study now by Richard Wise, where he was contrasting three different conditions where people were speaking aloud by Bobby or Poppy, sort of just grunting, just making a, a source sound basically, uh, 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 or mentally rehearsing it by Bobby or Poppy versus um, mouthing it silently. And actually this was a study designed to look at the respiratory control involved in speech because you need to engage respiratory control when you're saying by Bobby or Poppy or uh, 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 and you don't when you're mentally rehearsing it or silently, uh, silently mouthing it. But Richard Wise realized that you could go back and reanalyze this. And he did this and he compared the three conditions where you're actually making a sound when you speak by Bobby or Poppy. Um, sorry, the, four con the three conditions where you're articulating by Bobby or Poppy, uh, 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 and over that silent mental rotation, rehearsal, sorry, of the phrase. And what you find is right at the back of the temporal lobe, well, that, that little bump there, that's primary auditory cortex. And down here are all these fields I've been talking about in terms of really detailed processing of the incoming speech signal. Back here at the back end of the temporal lobe, behind primary auditory cortex and sitting quite medially, there is a brain area which is strongly responding when you speak, even if you speak. And actually, I think this is something that functional imaging for the first time really showed us that we did not know from the patient literature. A lot of the rest of this, we had a good clue from the patient literature. And this really does, it, I think you probably needed functional imaging to be able to show you what's happening when people are silently mouthing. And we're not the only people to have shown this. So Greg Hickok has reported this. It's been a very consistently found effect. These posterior medial auditory areas, which are recruited during articulation even if the articulation is silent and that is very interesting um here's just a more recent study where we replicated this so that's just showing you the direct comparison the regions here in yellow are activated when people are listening to somebody else talking the regions shown in blue and bluey purple are auditory regions which are activated when people speak and that's really quite striking a very distinct difference and in fact these regions here in yellow are actively suppressed when we speak. You turn off 
the brain areas that you'd use to listen to somebody else talking when you yourself are speaking and increase activation at the back end of the temporal lobes more. So this is the very just so we kind of catch up. We've got there are two at least these two different cortical processing streams in human auditory cortex. One running forward down the temporal lobe, this rostral stream associated with decoding and recognition processes associated with speech and almost certainly not limited just to, to spoken word recognition. On the right, for example, we're seeing it associated with recognizing non-verbal emotional vocalizations. I haven't really talked about spatial processing at all, but that's definitely something that you do find processed and represented in these caudal auditory areas, these posterior auditory areas, and these where these how pathways, this sort of sensory motor coordination. Um, so, for example, when somebody speaks under conditions where you change what their voice sounds like when they're speaking, so they're trying to compensate for that, that is associated with activation at the back end of the temporal lobe. So that does seem to be directly involved in, in sort of somatosensory guidance of articulation, but also changes when you need to change how you are speaking, that's associated with these posterior fields. Now, just have a very quick think about speaking aloud. Um, this is just a glimpse of the speech network. Now, speech production networks are actually highly predictable in humans. Um, in fact, here, a couple of these scans, this one and this one, these are single individuals who've just been scanned in, in fMRI. It really is a very, very predictable network that you get recruited. So you get sensory motor network, primary, uh, primary motor and primary sensory, sensory cortex. You've got these auditory fields. There's your little blob of Broca's area sitting there. There's Broca's area. And we get, we get supplementary motor cortex, which I'm not really going to talk about, which Cesar and I have been thinking about a lot and Cesar has published on. And, you've also, and then we've got within this, all of that is pretty, pretty bilateral. And then we've got sitting that is distinctly unilateral. We've got Broca's area and the anterior insula, which are activated when you're speaking. And there's that little field I've showed you before. There's that auditory cortex right at the back end, which is activated during speech production very strongly. Um, and actually, this is not just a speech network. This is a voluntary control network. When we are using our voice in a voluntary way, when I talk about speaking and using your rib cage to sort of produce this flow of air, we're talking about a voluntary controlled network. And actually, these areas here, these sensory motor areas, they've been called the lateral motor areas because they're so important for the control of speech. But in fact, you don't find this pattern of control recruited when other mammals vocalize. They do not use these systems. This voluntary control does seem to be a very human characteristic but it can be disrupted and now I want to take a bit of a turn into laughter. So what we have here is a recording from the Today programme which is the big news programme on BBC's Radio 4 pro, um, channel so the, the, the really important radio programme news that people the government listens to, important people listen to. And somebody's about to read the news. And here's the pitch of everybody's voices down here. I want you to listen to the voice of the woman who starts to read the news headlines. Singer Rock's unpopular replacement has now been dismissed with the army's popular chief of staff, Jack Twat, taking over. A 40-foot sperm whale, which was stranded in the Firth of Forth for more than four days, is now thought to be swimming towards open waters again. It freed itself late last night. Marine experts are hoping to establish this morning whether the whale is finally back at sea. Good luck to the whale. Ten past eight is the time. An investigation is underway at the meet. So what's happening there, if you work in voices, is actually very interesting. There's a guy coming down the line. So he's not in the studio. He's, he's, he's talking from another studio. And he has to say a silly name. So in the UK, uh, the word twat is quite, quite a rude word. And he's got to talk about, uh, I think, a French person who is the senior chief of staff, Jack Twat. And he just goes for it. Nothing too funny to see here. Chief of staff, popular chief of staff, Jack Twat. And back in the studio... Just before Charlotte Green, who's about to read the news headlines, actually starts to read the headlines, there's a gap. But if you listen very, very carefully and you look with a spectrogram in that gap, what you'll hear is someone whispering to Charlotte Green and they're whispering one thing only. They're whispering, Jack Twat. And they're trying to make her laugh. Now, at first, she's OK. And then you see these little distinct wiggles here. That is her starting to lose control over the pitch of her voice because she's actually starting to laugh happens a couple more times and then the pitch of her voice shoots up and then by the end she started to make squeaking noises 
because now she's completely laughing. Now, the really striking thing here is that she'll get in trouble for the this. The BBC does not like news broadcasters or sports broadcasters showing emotion in their voices. They call it breaking and it's considered to be very bad form. So she's not supposed to do that she still can't actually stop it happening. That's the power of laughter in terms of its ability to disrupt the control of normal voluntary vocalizations. The other thing that's quite striking is if you listen, the first thing that you'll notice is the pitch of her voice starts to go wrong. And that's because laughter starts to disrupt all that very fine control we're using of the intercostal muscles to control the flow of air out through the larynx. So before she starts laughing properly, the first thing that you'll notice is this change in the pitch of her voice. Now, this is not specific to laughter. If you're not a native English speaker, you may have picked up something else in her voice. You may have picked up that she was feeling some emotion. You may have even thought she was starting to cry. And that's because laughter isn't the only thing that can disrupt this voluntary use of the, the kind of the articulators. So, um, Often when we talk about non-verbal vocalizations, we're talking about involuntary vocalizations. And this involuntary vocalizations do seem to be driven by different brain regions and they can actually stop and disrupt fully normal speech production. So this is that image I showed you before. This is the dynamic, dynamic vocal tract imaging that we are using just to illustrate the points of what's happening during speech. And I just want to show you what's happening here with laughter. So this is the same woman laughing in the scanner. And what you'll notice is all of this fine movement and fine control goes away. So the mouth is open. The tongue is in a neutral position just at the bottom of the mouth. There is no complexity to these movements at all. A little bit of narrowing at the pharynx. Opening of the mouth wider, but that's what the deer was doing. Effectively, what we're looking at here is something that is more like an animal call than it is like speech. And actually, that's true quite often of non-verbal emotional vocalizations. They share these. They, they, they are like animal calls. Um, if we look in detail, so that's that metabolic breathing I showed you before. And this is that very fiery, fine control that we have going on for speech. Laughter, and you could see that woman was moving a lot, has actually evolved with very large and very rapid deflections of the chest wall. So instead of this very confined control for speech, you get single large contractions of the chest wall. And each one of those is just pushing air out. So there's no complexity of the sound at all. You can see that from the, the, art, the vocal tract imaging I showed you before. And you can actually see it here in a spectrogram. So there's the complexity of the spectrogram of speech. And that's a spectrogram of laughter. There is absolutely no complexity at all. You're not engaging any of this complex control. And interestingly, um, we've never actually managed to publish this, but the, what this actually means is that laughter is not just a very primitive sound. It's actually conveying a lot of information just to the amplitude envelope because each of those deflections of the chest wall is leading to one burst of sound. That, the characteristics of that amplitude envelope variation is very important for being able to recognize laughter. You can fill the amplitude envelope up of laughter with lots of different sounds and people will still hear laughter because you're getting it from that amplitude envelope and that's telling you just what's happening at someone's rib cage. Now for context, did that sound like laughter? It might have sounded a little bit like laughter. That's actually a bonobo laughing. So that's a chimpanzee. And that's what I mean when I say laughter is more like an animal call than it is like speech. It even sounds like an animal call. The only thing that's interesting, uh, not interesting, but I would say it's an interesting difference between um, the laughter produced by humans and the laughter produced by other apes is that other apes laugh on inhalation and exhalation. So they go he, 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 more like that. Whereas we laugh on one single exhalation. So there is still something interesting about the way that we can control our breathing, even when we're not trying able to control our breathing. And that's, this kind of involuntary invol engagement, the reason why these non-verbal vocalizations like laughter can stop us from talking or really change how our voice sounds when we talk is because it is controlled by a different network. So instead of these very distributed um, involvement of lots of these different motor areas that you're seeing for speech production, what you see is something more associated with midline systems for involuntary vocalizations. And that's associated with the um, periaqueductal gray, with brainstem nuclei and the anterior cingulate. And that we still have that. 
So people who have had strokes and who can't, they haven't got, they can't use or they have, don't have access to these more complex lateral motor systems and Broca's area that mean that they can speak, they can still do things like laugh or scream or swear. So these evolutionarily older pathway does seem important for more reactive sounds like emotional vocalizations. And of course that accounts for most of the vocalizations in other mammals, not all, but most. Now, this is kind of where I, I take a step back and talk about why I'm even talking about this at all. So my career has been largely spent looking at speech and voices and how, you know, the sounds of speech. And that was how I've been sort of progressing since my PhD. And then in the 19, late 1990s, I got involved with co colleagues in Cambridge University who were like Andy Calder and Andy Young, who were very interested in looking at how brains process information from the face. And they were looking at things like facial identity, facial speech, facial recognition of emotions. And they had patients with damage to the amygdala who could no longer recognize facial expressions of fear or anger, particularly fear. And they were sending these papers off to journals and, um, and people were saying, well, you don't know this is to do with the face or the emotion because you've only tested faces. So because I worked on voices, I got involved in this. And so I was coming up with auditory vocal versions of these faces. And these faces, these six faces we use because they are very robustly recognised. This is work by Paul Ekman showing that these are facial expressions that are recognised all around the world. By no means are they the only emotions that we express. And many emotions are highly uh, culturally determined, but there are a handful of these emotions that are recognised everywhere. And so Andy Calder and Andy Young were using them with patients who'd had damage to their brains. So they could guess, well, probably if you, these, you probably could recognise the emotions before you had these emotions before you had this brain damage. So you're, you can kind of do some probably because most people can recognize these you probably could do before you had the damage so if you now have a selective problem it does suggest that has been caused by the damage so i was working with this and coming up with sort of screams for fear and disgusted sounds and i just got very struck that everything was so negative like why i've experienced quite a lot of emotion in my life i can't remember the last time i was like properly properly disgusted um and that's you know that it's that was just interesting. I thought, well, maybe maybe these this handful of emotions, these basic emotions that Paul Ackman was working on, well, maybe they they just the evolution has given us these these more negative ones than the more important ones. And I got the chance to ask Paul Ackman about this at a conference, and he said, well, actually, he thought there were other positive emotions that might be basic emotions, which he hadn't tested because he was using a smile. That was his his happy emotion was just a smile. Um, and he thought specifically, and in fact, he'd written a paper about this that emotions like triumph what he called amusement, relief, contentment and pleasure. These would be candidate positive emotions that might be recognised more generally around the world. However, he didn't think they were very well expressed by the face. You need body movement. And he's done a lot of work on pride in that respect and the voice. And I thought, well, brilliant. You know, I work on the voice. Let's start doing this. So that's when I started working on laughter. And you'll notice I called it amusement because that was what I thought it was for many years. Um, and we got some, we, kept, we, you know, we just carried on this program. We would give people scenarios. We would get people to produce vocalizations that went with the scenarios. And my PhD student, Lisa Sosha, and I got some reasonably good evidence that in addition to these facial expressions of emotion, fear, disgust, anger, sadness, surprise, we came up with vocal versions of those. We could get, you know, we could get some reasonably good recognition for these positive basic emotions or putative basic emotions. Um, but it doesn't really count if you only work in your own culture, because if you want to ask questions about the recognition of emotions more generally, you have to embrace the fact that we live in a world where there's lots of different cultural experiences and emotions do influence that. So if you want to know something really recognized cross-culturally, you or is a basic emotion, you, you can't just study your own community. So my PhD student, Disa, did several trips out to Namibia with our, my postdoc, Frank Eisner, where she was working with members of the Himba community. Um, she was working with members of the Himba community who you'd have to drive for days to encounter. And she was traveling with an interpreter because um, there are now, you know, there's quite a tourist trade in Namibia and there are lots of Himba communities that you can visit as part of a more kind of visitor experience. She wasn't working with those. So the Himba people she was working with, and this is over 10 years ago now, the only contact they would have with with non Himba people would be people who a couple of the men a couple of times a year would have an interaction with an Angolan cattle dealer. That was that was that that was it. And so they're not contaminated by our culture. They don't have electricity. They're not 
are kind of exposed to films or other elements of Western culture. So if they recognize emotions from the voice of people back in the UK and vice versa, then we have some evidence that this might be something that has an element of cross-cultural robustness. Um, we did the same thing with the hymn that we'd done in the UK. So we gave people emotional scenarios and we asked them to make sounds that would go with those scenarios. See if you can recognize what's going on here. <laughs> now, you get absolutely no prizes for spotting that at the end there, he started laughing. Um, what do you think was the emotion that was happening at the start? I'll just play it one more time. So listen to the emotion he's expressing at the start. <laughs> <laughs> you may have thought it sounded quite it sounds like it's got quite a lot of energy in there it's quite you know quite a high level of arousal in, in, the, in the emotion terms um it does sound quite positive as well it doesn't sound like a negative sound what he's actually doing is expressing triumph a sense of achievement um now that is interesting because he understands what it means to celebrate something there are some emotions that are so culturally specific that it's actually fairly meaningless when you get outside of that culture people can't quite get to grips with with that they don't understand it, it doesn't mean so much to them uh, and that's not what we're dealing with here this is an emotion that he knows what that means he knows what it means to celebrate something however the emotional expression that he produces that goes with that is not cross-culturally recognized because people don't recognize it very well back in the uk so what we have there is an emotion that is definitely not a basic emotion because it's not its expression is different in different countries. It doesn't have the same meaning, but it's not something that's so culturally determined that it is so precise that somebody outside of that culture couldn't understand it. In contrast, the laughter at the end is extremely recognisable. And that's what we found. So this, this was a big study and it's hard to do these studies. It's essential to do these studies. It really, we're not going to carry on well in psychology for much longer if we keep just studying people in very narrow communities. Um, in sort of very brief uh, roundup, what we found was that the emotions that, that uh, Paul Ekman had demonstrated very well to be recognised cross-culturally from the face, so anger, disgust, fear, sadness and surprise, we could also replicate the recognition with the voice so um if you're in the middle of the namibian desert and you get vomit on your hand and go Ugh, they will know what you mean they may even feel a little bit disgusted um in contrast the positive emotions that we also tested and, and this is interesting i mean people have argued that the voice is not good at distinguishing between different kinds of vocal emotions that uh, the face is a better channel for that so actually this was in, in addition to sort of reinforcing Paul Ekman's work, it was also interesting for saying, well, actually, the, the voice really is an important channel for expressing emotion. Um, the positive emotions, these other ones, these new ones that we brought in. So we've got triumph, pleasure, relief and laughter. Um, we There's something funny happening with relief, happening to, happy to take questions on that, possibly also pleasure, maybe elements of triumph. But the only emotion that is really, really strongly showing cross-cultural recognition, the English recognised the Himba, the Himba recognised the English, is laughter. Now, um, you'll notice here that I've called it laughter rather than amusement. Um, all the other emotions I've discussed, I've described in terms of actually the emotion. Uh, and I've, I've struggled slightly with this. Um, as I say, for many years, I called it amusement. You can see down there, this graph is labeled AMU, short for amusement. But um, as you'll see shortly, actually, maybe that's not the best way of of characterizing laughter and it's worth thinking about if you look at the history of research into laughter expression and recognition the person who did some of the best work was Charles Darwin the earliest work a lot of what people like Paul Ekman and, and myself have been picking up on is absolutely stuff that Charles Darwin wrote about and it is interesting because if you go back and look at Charles Darwin's work he, he wrote about laughter he wrote about a lot of other emotions and a lot of all the other stuff he talked about and emotions we've picked up on and we largely have ignored laughter there are very very few scientific studies of laughter but Darwin thought that laughter was an expression of joy so maybe that's what we should have here but I'll come back to this now the origins of laughter mean that we probably should have actually realized it was going to be a very good candidate for a cross-culturally meaningful expression of emotion 
because we're not the only animal that laughs. Um, so laughter, how would you define this? How would you define if another animal was laughing? Well, what you would need to do is have some kind of operational constraint for saying, well, this is where I see it in humans. What would that mean for other mammals? So, for example, the first time that you see human infants laugh, it's normally when they're about three months old and it's normally doing something like tickling. The other thing that works on human babies to make them laugh is, is peekaboo. Now, interestingly, tickling is also where you first find laughter appearing for other apes and potentially even other mammals like rats. Um, and the interesting thing about tickling is that like peekaboo, you can't do it on your own. Someone else needs to be there. You have to be prepared to let them do this. You have to be prepared to interpret it as a fun, playful thing for the laughter to emerge, to work at all. Um, so, and you in fact can't tickle yourself. There's a very good brain basis for this. The brain is very good at distinguishing sensory information that comes from your actions versus things that are out there in the world. So even actually tickling is quite a complex thing, but it is where you first see laughter appearing in humans and in other non-human primates and even in rats. That's the first appearance of laughter-like behavior. Um, it is quite interesting that that's social. It's nothing funny about this. And this is where I started to think, oh, hang on, am I, am I wrong about, I've just been calling this amusement. So babies don't laugh when they're tickled because it's funny. They laugh because of the social element of that interaction is probably our best guess. And that does seem to be, in fact, probably the only reason why tickling exists. It's a way to get laughter going in these safe, trusting social interactions. Um, I'll come back to that. But I think that the important thing to note here is that the initial emergence of laughter for humans and other apes and maybe even other animals like rats, it's something that's it's, it's a social behavior. It's a social expression. Laughter is a social expression of emotion. As we get older, across humans, across other mammals, where you find laughter, given that not, there aren't that many studies, it's strongly associated with play. Now, play is a very, very important behavior for mammals. All mammals play when they're juveniles. We have big brains compared to other mammals, sorry, other animals, and we have very extended periods of being juveniles when we're growing those big brains. And one really important way for growing our big brains is through play. Now, play can be very ambiguous. The same behavior could be sexual or aggressive. You need to mark that you are playing and because play is very different from animal to animal. Kittens don't play like gerbils. So animals, mammals have different ways of marking the fact that they're playing. You get something called play face, a very loose, unthreatening, open mouth. You get for dogs, play is so important, they do something called a play bow. They make this gesture that means everything after this is a game. And when there's a sound associated with this, it's the sound of laughter. In fact, Panksepp, who's done the work on laughter-like vocalizations in rats, has argued that the, the key feature across where you find laughter and what it means whenever you find it in, in humans and other mammals, it's, it's an invitation to play. It has this you know, let, let's, let's take part in this activity that is fun and the end is just the end in itself. And all I've emphasized it being important for juveniles, in fact, some mammals, humans, dogs, otters, play their whole lives. So it's a very, very important social behavior. Uh, just to show you, so we have some primates, it's very hard to get human adults in a play face. They tend to tighten up into a, more of a social smile. It's much easier with children. So I just need you to notice how much like a chimpanzee my brother looks there. Um, but it's so important, the role of play um, and laughter. So there has there was a couple of really interesting studies looking at devocalized rats. So rats who can't make any vocalization sounds and rats are very social mammals. They play a lot with other rats. Now, these rats who've been devocalized, they will play with the other rats. The other rats want to play with them. There is they're, they're not being there's no barrier to them playing, but they are more likely to get bitten during play than the other rats because they cannot make this sound that shows that their intent is to be playful. So it's not just an invitation to play, it's an expression of intention to be playful so that behavior is not interpreted as, as aggression, for example, leading to this escalation into them getting bitten. Another interesting aspect of laughter is that it's very contagious as in a lot of the laughter you produce is simply happening because other people are laughing and you've caught the laughter from them. Now, contagion, Robert Provine's written a lot about this. It's, 
it's found across an, a number of human behaviors. So we do, we yawn contagiously, we laugh contagiously, we cough contagiously, we will scratch ourselves contagiously. And in fact, we even blink contagiously. Most of the blinks that you produce are not being produced because your eye actually needs refreshing. It's because you are catching a blink from somebody else. And he argues that their, 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 their role is primarily affiliative. It is something that you're much more likely to do with someone else than someone than a, that, that you know than a stranger. So you're much more likely to catch a laugh or a yawn from someone you know than someone you don't know. And that it just seems to be like a basic low cost affiliative way of showing showing that relationship, showing that closeness. And not only found in humans, dogs will catch yawning contagiously. Chimpanzees will catch yawning contagiously. Um, and it's something that we learn to do. We're not born showing contagious behaviors. Babies don't do any contagious laughing or blinking or yawning. We effectively perhaps teach babies to laugh contagiously by the way that we laugh around them. But this, this was another point at which we kind of came in and laughter was looking a little bit different to us from some of the other nonverbal emotional expressions we were looking at. So most of my functional imaging studies, as you've already seen, they're on speech and, and some things to do with speech and language. And we did a, few, a study a few years ago well, I was just interested in saying, what are the brain regions that are recruited when it's not speech, when you're listening to something that is one of these non-verbal emotional expressions? So he chose fear and anger. So fear and disgust, because they're very different from each other and they're very recognisable. People don't confuse fear and disgust and they're both very negative. And then we had triumph and laughter. Again, not confused with each other, very really highly recognised. Uh, strongly positive and then we just did what we normally did with people where they listen to speech you know, sorry normal versions of these emotional sounds and inspection rotated versions and we scanned them and the thing that was really striking was that we got loads more activation in orofacial mirror regions shown up here than we were expecting to see in fact the extent to which and this was spotted by my my colleague jo jane warren who's the first author on the study we stopped the study and started again, including a motor localizer so we could actually properly model for brain areas recruited both by hearing sounds and by moving your face. And that's shown up here in green. So these are these lateral sensory motor cortex and supplementary motor cortex. There's a lot of talk about how motor cortex is recruited when people hear speech. That is dwarfed by the effect we're seeing for these non-verbal emotional vocalizations, very much so. But very strikingly, it wasn't the same for all the emotions. In fact, if you look at the different elements of how, how low or high in arousal the emotional sounds are or how low or high in valence they are, what you find, the high arousal, high valence sounds are what are driving this orofacial mirror system. So a lot to do with arousal in the supplementary motor cortex and a mix of arousal and positive valence in these bilateral sensory motor fields that actually means that in practice, this is being primarily driven by the laughter stimuli and somewhat by the triumph stimuli. So this strong pattern of orofacial mirror responses is being strongly, strongly driven by laughter and by triumph sounds, i.e. by positive emotions. And perhaps that is contagion. These are certainly the laughter is something that is we, we share contagiously and we actually like doing with other people. We will laugh more when we're with other people. Just to show you about the power of some of the contagion and laughter, this is a film from an American religious TV program. I use examples in broadcasting because people are normally trying not to laugh. They're normally trying to actually inhibit laughter and it still comes through. So the guy that you can see here with the glasses, he hears somebody that makes him laugh. And he, if you watch him, you'll see at first he's kind of going like this because he's trying to stop laughing. And then the laughter gets him and he starts laughing very hard. His colleague, who's not wearing glasses, is obviously concerned about what's happening. This is television and we're like, well, he's laughing at someone who's rung in to, to sing a hymn. Um, and he looks concerned. He keeps shooting glances at his colleague and then looking at the camera. He's obviously worried about what's going on, but he also keeps laughing. And that is just contagious laughter. So look out. This man is going to laugh. That's happening. Look what's happening to his colleague who keeps smiling and laughing. Even in between, he looks worried. And that's contagious laughter at play. We're really trying to get out there in the, in the records. But, but we're just going to sing for you. I'm going to sing for you right now. Okay. I cry in the midnight hour. Yes. Yeah. You heard my cry. You brought up all of my tears. This world, world, world. Oh, well. 
I certainly did enjoy that. I'm going to score out in the spirit. He's uh, getting the Holy Ghost over here. <laughs> we want to. Uh, <laughs> he has the spirit. Uh, he still loves you. We want to get, uh, get his address. <laughs> get his address. And uh, we want to give you a t shirt here. Oh. Uh, send him a t shirt. Oh. Right here. Right. <laughs> More confidence. Enjoy oh. that, uh, Danny, oh. Florida. Oh, I know it'd be the same. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it broke me up. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we go we'll on. be right back. We'll be right back. So that's just the power of, of contagion and laughter. It's really quite striking. Um, and actually, when we look, but even that, the, the, the contagion and laughter, it's still social. It's going to be much more likely to happen with someone you know than someone you don't know. If those had been two strangers, I suspect that they, there would have been a lot less laughter from the, the more worried man. Now, adult humans in laughter, it starts to get very interesting. This is, again, a lot of Robert Provine's work. So what Robert Provine found is if you ask people what makes them laugh, they'll talk about jokes and humour. Because that's what we think laughter is. I called laughter amusement for many years. But in fact, what Provine found is that just like tickling, in infants and contagious laughter and play. It is primarily a social behavior. You're 30 times more likely to laugh if there is somebody else with you than if you're on your own. And you'll laugh more if you know those people and you'll laugh more if you like those people. So it's an intensely social behavior. And what this means is, and now we spin back to language, what, where most laughter happens is during conversations. That's where most laughter actually takes place because laughter happens most when you're with other people and as does speech production, if we're absolutely honest. And that's where, it, and it's a social emotion. It's this joyful emotion as, as Darwin described it, but it's one that lives in social interactions. When you're with other people, the dominant way to interact with them is through speaking to them or having a conversation with them in, in sign or speech. And that's where laughter is most commonly found. And everybody laughs more than they think they do, given that there are not that many studies on this, but most, most people, everybody that's been studied, laughs less, laughs more than they think they do. Every, it's almost like we don't notice the amount of laughter that we're producing. It's such a, such a baseline kind of level of laughter is, is almost like we're, what we're attuned to. And we don't notice changes in that. We laugh more if we know other people. Um, and in fact, Robert Provine found, so we can we laugh for very complex reasons. So you can be laughing just because other people are laughing. So laughter can just be contagious. You have no idea why that's happening. We will laugh to make and maintain social bonds. So it never loses this intense sort of social role. And that's a very, very important use of laughter. Laughter is a very important way of showing affiliation with someone and expressing your affection for them. And you can also use it to, in perhaps in a situation with someone that you might never see again, but to make that, infant, that's, make that whole interaction go more smoothly by using some laughter and sort of showing that your intentions are playful. And this is maybe just by you know, buying a ticket at the railway station, it goes a little bit more smoothly because everyone makes, uh, enjoys a bit of laughter. We will laugh highly communicatively. So within those conversations, Robert Provine noted, people are hardly ever laughing at jokes. People laugh at statements and comments. People laugh at things like, oh, I might miss my bus or I will have another cup of coffee. Because actually what people are doing with laughter is laughing to show that we agree, we understand, we remember, we recognize. And in fact, at any one point in time, Robert Provine found the person who laughs most is the person who's talking because we're using our laughter to get other people to show that they agree, they understand, they remember, they recognize. And I think this is extraordinary. So in the middle of social interactions with other people, spoken interactions with other people, we've got this incredible thing of human spoken language, which is sort of unparalleled in its complexity um, for perception and production, then the whole linguistic system it's representing. We drop into this old mammal vocalization all the time to do a great deal of the social 
and emotional work of that conversation. And we will also love to reframe things as play. So we will love to make things seem better. And this is a very common use of laughter. So for example, there is quite a big, by, by standards of laughter literature, still small, but a, there's a, there is a literature looking at high stress jobs where people will often use like in the police service or the fire service or medicine or nursing, they often use have quite dark senses of humor or they use quite dark um, jokes, jokes that can seem genuinely shocking if you're not part of that profession. And that's doing a few things. It's, it's deliberately keeping outsiders out and that's helping reinforce the bonds between the people who are working normally in a team that needs to work well together. It's helping them reframe things as less serious they are and at the same time deal with the stress so these are high stress jobs where you need to work in a team and deal with horrible stuff and actually sort of almost formalizing a use of laughter around that here in the example of actual overt jokes is a very uh, a good example of actually using the playfulness of laughter to deal with negative aspects of the interactions so laughter is really interesting it's it's something that's really important in, in social interactions with other people. And I think um, given that we know now how important social networks are for humans, our social networks really matter. The number of friends that we have, the contacts that we have with those friends really matters. And I think the, the important part for this probably is the nodes in those networks when you're actually with those friends is the fact that you get to share conversations with them and you get to share laughter. So the benefit to humans in terms of longevity, health and mental health that come from this social networks I suspect come from our use of language and laughter together in those networks <laughs> now here's, here's someone laughing I'll just play that one again <laughs> now that's me laughing um actually in a spontaneous way I've, I've been made to laugh at something I couldn't stop that laugh if I if I wanted to and that's a very involuntary laugh I, I have a very high pitched laugh I, I couldn't sing that high I'd love to be able to do that with my voice here's another laugh <laughs> now that's more of one of those conversational laughs um that's not, not somebody laughing spontaneously and actually most of the laughter you encounter because it's happening in conversations actually most of it is there's more kind of communicative conversational laugh and I think it probably is distinctly different from spontaneous laughter it seems to be different in its timing it's possibly different in its brain system it might be more associated with this voluntary motor network it's something that we're, we're trying to look at now and certainly if you look at the timing of laughter so spontaneous laughter both that guy laughing on the television program or the woman I played you laughing at the news there was quite a long gap between the thing that triggered the laughter and the laughter starting that is not the case for conversational communicative laughter. If you look at people having conversations, they laugh together really tightly in coordination and they laugh at certain points in the sentence. So people tend to laugh at the end of a sentence together, even if they're having a sign language conversation where in fact they could laugh all the way through. They don't. You laugh in this very coordinated way. So I think this more communicative conversational laughter probably does share more of its basis in the voluntary motor network that you're using for speaking. And that maybe enables you to coordinate it in this way in your conversation. Um, we use these, we generated these two different kinds of laughs because we were interested in perhaps they have different sorts of, maybe they really are different sorts of laughs. Um, and we took them back into the scanner. And what we found was, well, there does seem to be some evidence for this. So what we found was that that spontaneous laughter, which for brevity here I've called real laughter, uh, it's not being forced in any way. It's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a spontaneous involuntary vocalization associated presumably with this midline system <coughs> sorry those laughs are associated with activation in these mo these uh, bilateral auditory cortex actually possibly because you hear sounds you never hear in any other context when people are laughing really intensely you get these very weird squeaks and whistles um and there's actually i was quite worried here because i thought there would be less activation to this more communicative laughter shown here in pink because it just doesn't sound as as strong it doesn't sound as much as sort of like as insalient but actually it activates the brain more so in this study people were just listening to laughs and other noises and we, they didn't know there were different kinds of laughs in there and they didn't know it was a study of laughter and what you find is there's a lot more activation now not in auditory cortex back in those medial prefrontal areas i mentioned before for semantic processing and in dorsum lateral sorry in, in dorsal thalamic fields and also extending into the anterior thalamus and the right inferior 
uh, and Tiriensula. Um, those are all being recruited to, to this more kind of communicative, conversational laughter. And I think that's because laughter is never neutral. When you hear someone laughing intentionally, so it's not a spontaneous laugh like that first one I played you then, it, there's, some, there's some meaning behind it, there's an intention behind it. You're trying to work out, well, why is that person laughing? And when you hear a laugh that is definitely not spontaneous, <laughs> that might be someone trying to uh, show that they get a joke. Maybe it's someone trying to pretend that they're not sad. Maybe it's somebody trying to cover up being in pain or cover up being angry. Maybe it's someone trying to diffuse a slightly difficult situation. There's always meaning behind an intentional laugh. And you're trying to understand it. And you're trying to understand it using the exact networks you would use to try and understand complexity in spoken language and these are also networks that you'd use to try and understand someone else's intentions so there's a really interesting overlap here of what's called so-called theory of mind areas semantic processing areas and trying to understand the meaning of this apparently very simple but in fact very complex nonverbal vocalization and that response i showed you earlier that aura facial mirror response we got that from this study um, but interestingly, it was the same for both kinds of laugh. It wasn't distinct, didn't distinguish strongly between the two kinds of laughter. And, and I thought that they might do because actually everybody rates that spontaneous laughter as sounding more contagious. Um, but it wasn't. And in fact, what was different was across different people. So we got people out of the scanner and in the scanner, they were just listening and we gave them a test where they had to quickly classify the laughs into these spontaneous laughs or more community conversational laughter. And what you find is the more accurate they were at doing that, the more they had activated that orofacial mirror system earlier when they were listening to any laughter. So it's probably not just contagion. When you're listening to any laughter and you are primed to join in, that seems to actually correlate with how good you are at understanding what the laughter means. And that's interesting because, of course, we know that you learn to do this. Um, and that might be really important. So, again, why might it matter? Well, again, thinking about the social networks and the fact that laughter lives in these social spaces. This is a study that we did in collaboration with um, Eamon McCrory, Essie Vidding and Liz Onions. This is actually run by Cesar Lima, um, where we were asking the question of what happens in the brain when people hear laughter who have had different developmental trajectories. So actually this is a study all on teenage boys, three different groups of teenage boys, teenage boys developing normally, teenage boys who have high levels of conduct disorder, so their behavior is, is bad. And also they score high on what's called callous and unemotional traits. And that means they don't care if other people are hurt. And that, that mix of high in conduct disorders, high in callous and unemotional traits puts them at risk of being of psychopathy as in later life. And then there's a third group of boys who have conduct disorders, but are low in these callous and unemotional traits. So they might do bad things, but they feel bad. And interestingly, if you compare the typically developing boys and the boys at risk of psychopathy, what you find is the boys at risk of psychopathy rate the laughter as less contagious. Remember, of course, we learn to laugh. We, we learn to laugh contagiously. They're writing it as less contagious and they are showing a reduced response cortically. Now, given that all these boys are on the trajectory of learning about laughter, we learn about laughter throughout our entire early adult life. You don't know here if what we're seeing is the direction of causality. We're just seeing an association. So you don't know if the boys at risk of psychopathy are having um, more difficulty understanding laughter because of the, the, the problems that are also putting them at risk of psychopathy, or if because they have not had the opportunities to learn about how to laugh contagiously, they would, we don't know. So the, con the, the direction of causality is not established. However, I think this is quite an interesting example of the importance of studying laughter as a social emotion, because it's an emotion that if it is disrupted or your processing of it is disrupted, that's gonna have an immediate effect on the sorts of social interactions that you have. If you can't laugh contagiously, if you can't share laughter with other people, even very transiently in perhaps situations where you don't know other people so well, that's actually taking you away from a lot of the ways that you would normally find ways of dealing with stress, making, maintaining social bonds, expressing affection and affiliation with each other. So what you might be seeing here is something that it's not as simple as saying, well, uh, psychopathy is entirely a problem of laughter, but laughter is shining a very interesting light on the way that those problems could develop. 
So laughter has been described as the shortest distance between two people. And I've always liked that because it kind of gets the intimacy of laughter. And the thing that I was really struck by for many years, I thought my work on speech and language and my work on laughter was two entirely separate paths until I realized, in fact, in conversations, in interactions, that's where these things live together. So I've always, you know, I start talks with, oh, you're 30 times more likely to laugh with someone else than when you're on your own. But the same is true of talking. These are social behaviours. These are ways that we're incredibly important ways that we have for making and maintaining social bonds. They probably are the really important parts in the nodes of our social networks. And what I'd really like to know more about is, in fact, how these two apparently distinctly different in evolutionary terms vocalizations are being coordinated during interactions because I think there's a really in, potentially very interesting integration of these older and these much more recent evolutionary brain regions underpinning this kind of processing. And just to take one further step back, um, I've been emphasizing all the way through like the complexity and the laughter is a very simple sound, speech is a very complex sound. And I used to start all my talks by saying human speech is the most uh, complex sound in nature. But something else that I've been looking at over the past few years is other kinds of vocal skill. And I just want to show you what beatboxing looks like in the in this vocal tract imaging use of MRI. So beatboxing is when people use their uh, vocal tract normally in quite a uh, individual way to create genuinely polyphonic sounding music. For example, they frequently produce multiple sources of sound at the same time. And that's what this looks like in the scanner. So this is Reaps One beatboxing. So the point I want to make here is human speech is one of the most complex sounds in nature, but compared to beatboxing, we are using a tiny fraction of the skills at our disposal for controlling those amazing articulators. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Thank you to all my collaborators. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie. One, what a wonderful way to finish the, the talk with beatboxing. <laughs> Uh, now we have some time for questions. We have already uh, one question here. Um, so Paula Vitor uh, is asking if uh, fake laughter, if we started, uh, started uh, as a physical activity like we do in um, laughter yoga, if it recruits the same neural mechanisms um, that we recruit when we laugh spontaneously. Um, I think at first it probably looks more like conversational laughter. That'd be my guess. And then, but because laughter primes laughter and often in laughter yoga, people end up laughing very spontaneously. I suspect you would end up something recruiting that much older pathway. Um, I, I, I've always, when I, I'm very conscious that when we talk about laughter and brain imaging, I show the vocal tract stuff and they, then I go straight off to perception because it's really, really hard to scan people actually with the brain responses of people while they're actually laughing in the scanner because laughter doesn't happen unless people feel reasonably comfortable. They don't laugh randomly. They don't laugh just anywhere. Um, so it's actually that the real, the vocal tract imaging was quite hard to do, but at least that's quite quick. For brain imaging data, you need more trials. And we are still working on ways of actually looking at that. Because what I would love to do is actually really visualize the brain networks that are recruited during conversational laughter and spontaneous laughter. And one day, hopefully, we will get closer to that. But it, it, that's particularly difficult to do. Um, we have one more question here, an interesting one, by the way. Uh, so what do you think of laughter as a potential marker for language development? Um, 
Well, I suspect it's actually very, very interesting. So there was some work from, I think, Sheffield showing that babies, well before they are able, you know, given that per language perception skills develop more quickly than language production skills, because it's hard to, you know, that there's a lot more sort of control. So that's, that's normal, perception outstripping production. But... Um, still before babies are able or toddlers are able to do anything complex with vocal production they have already got really good understandings of laughter so they know what it means to make their parents laugh and they will do things to make their parents laugh and they know uh like if you put them in a strange situation with an adult doing something peculiar if their mother reacts to that with laughter they react by relaxing whereas if their mother reacts in something not involving laughter, the, the toddler will remain a lot more worried about what's going on because there's something strange. So I think there's probably a very good argument for, well, I think we need to understand development in children and teenagers about laughter full stop because we just don't know. But I think there's very, very exciting initial evidence that there's real complexity in older babies and toddlers understanding of what laughter means that is outstripping the kind of verbal skills that are anyway close to having. So I think there probably would be a very good role for that. And we have one related question actually. So uh, would it make sense to use laughter to sort of screen uh, or to assess neurodevelopmental disorders like autism? So laughter in autism. Well, you've been, you've been doing stuff on this, right? We have been doing some stuff on this. So my PhD student, Ceci, has She's done a few. So quite often what we do is we ask people just to rate what the laughter sounds like to them. Like how contagious does that laughter sound like to you and how um, spontaneous does that laughter sound to you? And she's taken that those sorts of stimuli and those questions and, and run that study with people with autism. They do show different profiles from neurotypical people. These are all adults, by the way. But Ceci was very worried that asking those slightly weird questions like does this make you want to join in how spontaneous does it sound they're quite odd questions that might not have the same meaning to the people with autism so she came up with a study where we added laughter onto the end of jokes and we just got people to rate how funny the jokes were and there was there was either no laughter at all or some laughter that was or conversational laughter or spontaneous laughter. And what she found was adding any laughter made the jokes seem funnier. And people just asked, how funny is this joke? And they were terrible jokes. But she found it was exactly the same for people with autism as for the match controls. In fact, if anything, people with autism rated everything as funnier. But every they, they were they were they found the jokes funnier if the, the jokes had a spontaneous laugh added on, which suggested they were processing the laughter in quite a similar way, well, in a similar way. Now there's two important things there. These are adults and we do know that people, um, people with autism may show the same behavior, but are using different brain systems to underpin that. And in fact, Ceci is doing a brain imaging study, hopefully when we come out of COVID to answer that question at the moment. But it's also possibly, I think it's also possibly telling us something important about like the paradigms we use, just because you pick up a difference between people with autism, people without autism, that could still be something about your task that is, that is preventing the people with autism from being able to see, you know, make sense of it in the same way. You're, you're making assumptions of them that may not make sense. Uh, and mm -hmm. it certainly used to be thought that people with autism perhaps didn't laugh much. I think they actually do, they do laugh a lot. Um, but they may, all, they may also be more commonly sort of stuck with neurotypical people who laugh differently and they find that, you know, um, that, that leads to them looking different or feeling different. That, so it may also be kind of context sometimes. Mm -hmm. Could be interesting to run a study um, with them using like implicit measures like EEG, for instance, to see if their face react differently in terms of like- contagion. Definitely, definitely, definitely. So while we wait to see if there's more questions come through, I have a couple of questions myself. So uh, you've discussed several aspects related to laughter authenticity and that got me thinking about crying because we've been also doing some stuff uh, on crying. And uh, one striking thing is that we often see that people tend to perceive uh, crying as um, less authentic in general compared to laughter. 
And uh, in a few studies, we've seen that people also struggle more uh, to detect authenticity in crying than in laughter. What do you think uh, about this? Why, why, what, what do you think is going on with crying? Um, well, it's a very good question. And um, I mean, the background to this is Cesar and I have have created a set of stimuli of people crying or everything we've done with laughter we've also got for crying and it's that was, that was hard work but it, it is a very interesting behavior crying because it it it's used it is so if you think about just like the order in which vocalizations are used communicatively by babies crying comes in first and then laughter comes in and and they both are being used with a really quite quite a lot of nuance by a, quite a young age and and they are confusable for each other frequently they can like literally sound like they're made in very similar ways they even fe people feel better when they've been crying people feel better when they've been laughing but most people i'm not one of them so i just didn't believe these data until i went and replicated it myself but most people feel better when they've had a cry so there are there's a lot of sort of similarity they and they can both overwhelm the motor system like when they start you can't stop them so there's a i suspect something very interesting there that may be selectively relevant for laughter and crying. And also the only, they are the only two emotions that are crop up as symptoms in degenerative diseases. So you can get with quite a range of things like head injuries or different kinds of dementias, laughter and crying, one or both, turning up as, as involuntary vocalizations that, are, that have any link to any emotional state. And they're just sounds people, they, again, they seem to have this way into the motor system. So there is something odd about them, but they also change in terms of how they use. So we, in the UK, uh, arguably have a bit of a, a sort of a display rule. So display rules are an emotion are about sort of how acceptable emotions are. And we, we don't mind laughter and every well, the thing about it, just laughter on its own. Every culture has a point where laughter is rude, and there's where, where situations where laughter is inappropriate. Um, and we have the same one for crying, but it's much, much lower. <laughs> very, very few situations in the UK is it acceptable to cry, and it's certainly not acceptable to cry in an adult, in a man, in a way that sort of looks like we're, it's not real. Um, and that's not the case all around the world. There are lots of cultures where laughter is publicly acceptable and can be so um, there was a there was a viral video that went really big in the UK a few years ago of a Japanese politician apologizing on television for having been caught. Uh, I think it was a fraud case and he cried all the way through in a way that looked really weird to people in the UK because it didn't look real and looked very performative. But that was completely appropriate in his culture. That was an entirely way, you know, totally appropriate way of reacting to the, the shame. Um, so there are these very big cultural things that I think impact on that. And they change. So in the UK, it used to be up before the First World War, it was a sign of sort of emotional sensitivity and civility in men to cry. The prime minister would cry at the dispatch box. It wasn't a... And now we kind of got absolute conniptions if we think somebody's, particularly a man, is crying. It's like, what's going on? So there, I think those are really big things that affect it. But I think it also means that you probably would, you probably could learn a lot more about how laughter and like, crying are used communicatively by, by looking at other cultures. Um, so Sinead Chen, who we've both worked with, has pointed out that crying is used very, very differently in Taiwan. Than it is in the UK, and I suspect that you probably could find a different sort of happiness to deal with, you know, or, or recognise authenticity in crying. It might, but that's 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 still you know work that needs to be yeah, done. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. It could be like in Western cultures, like the UK or Portugal, because the, we have the same display rules. It could be that we just don't have enough exposure to crying, so it's like we could have more expertise. Um, yeah with laughter than we have with crying or our stimuli are just not good enough that could be also a methodological <laughs> problem but. i don't know i think i i'm really happy that we have the stimuli that we have because um i remember reading one of paul ekman's books about emotions and he has a photograph in one of them of a woman who's she's speaking in a public event and she's recently lost a son and her face is just racked with grief and even in a photograph, it's quite obvious. It's unmissable. And it, 
and he's saying about the kind of the like the he's talking about the intensity of the emotion i don't think he would use the phrase authenticity but that's and and i just remember looking at that and thinking because this is years ago this is years before i met you i thought none of my none of my sadness vocalizations are anywhere close to this there are always people going hmm, you know they weren't even the sounds of someone properly crying even pretending to properly cry so i think we've probably got you know i mean i can imagine we could get more more authentic ones but they are they are pretty good i think we just need to get i think you're right i think there's we don't do enough uh, recognition that we we learn to use laughter in this social way over our entire early adult life so we have a very nuanced understanding of it there's a lot of still a lot of variation but because you learn about it in interactions no one tells you you don't read a book that's you, you, it, and you learn about your own laughter at the same time you're learning about other people's laughter and we don't do that with crying the time when we did do that with crying was probably when we were children and children do ch toddlers do laugh sorry do cry in a more formative way that is something that in fact that's one of the reasons why we were first thinking of this so i think that that might be it might be very interesting to look at that as you say and it if you could actually find some way of skilling people up as a way of recognizing it, I think that might make a big difference. Yeah, yeah that could be interesting. And we have one more question here. Um, someone is saying that when we induce laughter in adults with dementia, uh, quite often that opens a window uh, for a language and uh, interactions with uh, like good quality interaction. Mm. What are your thoughts on, um, on this laughter in dementia? and laughter as a window through which we get open uh, communication. I think that's very interesting because I've talked a bit about this with Kath Loveday, who has, she's shown that people, you know, that you may have seen those videos of people with dementia being shown familiar music from when they were younger and they tend to react to it quite, quite strikingly. There's a lot of recognition, even in people who are in a very severe condition. And she's argued that, um, there's not a special role for music, but there's, you know, you, you stuff that you really like that you're very kind of strong emotional attraction to kind of doesn't, it does seem to have this privileged relationship with memory such that your, in, your emotional engagement to that isn't lost when lots of other things are lost. And I suspect the same thing. And she thinks the same thing might be true for, for things that make you laugh. So the things that you could actually use to trigger the laughter, um, there are some things, what's the best way of describing this? So the, if you, and I've, I've sort of avoided humor all the way through, but actually it, it is, that is a big cultural role for laughter triggers. And she thinks that you probably could do something similar with laughter as a way of kind of just making that kind of emotional link into that familiarity and love of the thing that gave you that emotional reaction to the music or that made you laugh. So that would, that, I think it does, I think opening a window is a very good phrase for that because I think it does sort of, it tricks you into a way in to an emotional engagement like music can do that actually lots of other things can't do. Uh, many other systems might be barriers to that. Like if you can't recognize people's faces anymore then that's gonna be hard for you to have that same engagement but music and laughter might just seem to kind of get around the edges so many studies to run <laughs> definitely i have one uh, final uh, question uh, and it's uh, about the two vocal control systems um, when you mentioned them uh, and you were saying that people who lose their ability to to speak because of a stroke for example they can still laugh and i was wondering do we know if they can still fake laughter Good question. One more study. Know. <laughs> know. No, another study. I, I honestly don't know. So it's always anecdotal. You know, I'm like even I, actually that the example I gave at the top of, of Tom Brocker's, pa Brocker's patient, he could say Tom, and he could he could laugh and cry and swear. You know, so it, it crops up as this kind of like note in the descriptions of lots of people, and it's not there as a. You know, um, it's it's very very seldom systematically investigated. I think probably because it's easier to look at production and perception. So you'd need to find some ways of actually engaging it. But I, it would be very very interesting. There there are a handful of studies looking at what's preserved about conversation for people who have aphasia, and you can get a lot of things that are 
preserved about conversational interactions, even if the words are missing because someone's lost verbal skills. Um, and that would suggest that laughter might still be there, but it would be really interesting to know. Yeah, because if, if we think that fake laughter might depend more yes. on the control systems, presumably, presumably fake laughter specifically could sort of go away when language is impaired, but yeah. spontaneous laughter could be yeah. preserved. It could be it would, that would be See, the prediction. The dissociation yeah. is, actually, is actually there. Right, I think there are no more questions. I mean, I could spend the entire afternoon <laughs> asking <laughs> questions, <laughs> but <laughs> I know it's sunny in London, so uh, I think we, we can finish uh, here. Uh, I want to thank you again, Sophie. It was really wonderful uh, to see Pleasure. you and to hear you. Um, really interesting uh, to talk. So enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great weekend, and I hope you get to, to enjoy uh, the sun. I will do. Thank you so bye. much for inviting me, and it's lovely seeing you, Cesar. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. And thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.